killed 28. In the church Bibles, it's 858. My greetings to you and welcome to you. Um, if you're here for the first time um, or if you're joining us after a time away, uh, my name's Lee. I'm the senior pastor of the church, and I'd love to get to know you, as would our whole uh, church uh, family. But with God's uh, word open before us, you may also find it useful as an outline too, just to guide us through. You might want to take some notes or just have it beside you to keep track of where we're going. But with God's written word open, let's pray for the help of God's spirit. Let's pray. Uh, dear Father, we thank you that you are the God who speaks to us. You are the God who addresses your people. You love us enough to give us words, words that are good, words that are clear, words that are relevant. So we pray that we'd listen attentively, but not just to listen, we pray that you would give us that ability to want to put into practice what you say to us this morning. For the glory of Christ, we pray. Amen. Uh, many of us are plagued and crushed by low self-esteem. Maybe that is you, as I say that out loud. Countless people uh, wake up in the morning feeling rubbish. Uh, feeling rubbish not just about life in general, but they wake up in the morning and they feel rubbish about themselves. Uh, they have no energy for the day ahead. They have no confidence that they have a valued place in the global village. And they rather fear that if they didn't turn up to a destination, no one would ever notice. Uh, low self-esteem is devastating for human life. And of course, there are many secular suggestions for how to tackle that problem. Uh, just last night, I did what you always do when you want to do some research. You open up your web browser, you go into Google, and you type in the question. And on the NHS website, there are pages devoted to how do you recover from low self-esteem. So here are some tips uh, straight from the NHS website. One, recognize what you're good at. That is really hard to do, however, if you really are convinced that you are rubbish at everything. But that's one step. Two, build positive relationships. And three, be kind to yourself. And the tips continue. Now, I'm sure they are helpful in their little ways. I'm sure they are actually quite valuable for many people. But let me say, there is nothing quite like the solution of the Lord Jesus Christ to the issue and the problem of low self-esteem. Let me tell you the answer that comes from Christianity, the answer from the Lord Jesus Christ. He says to us, I love you. And I love you not because you are lovable, and not because you are valuable, and not because you contribute anything, not because you are a useful little engine, as Thomas the Tank Engine would say, but you are loved because I am full of love, and I have died on the cross for you. And when you trust in me as your savior, you will become a member of my father's family. You will be adopted, and you will be valuable, not because of what you contribute, and not because of your performance, but simply because you are a beloved daughter or son of the King of Kings. Now, that is the answer to low self-esteem. Many of us struggle with it. Maybe that is a particular word for you as you listen this morning. But let me say, there is also another problem that our world suffers from, and it is at the opposite end of the spectrum to low self-esteem. If low self-esteem is over here, at the opposite end of the spectrum, and it is not the most popular conversation topic, it is the problem of high self-esteem. Or in the more popular language, it is called pride. And it may not be as popular in our contemporary discussions as its smaller cousin, but high self-esteem or pride is very deadly. Having an inflated view of ourselves is a recipe for disaster, both now in our lives and also in the judgment to come. And what we are confronted with in Ezekiel chapter 28 is the ugly problem of pride. In fact, if you look at your Bibles, the surrounding chapters are also full of this haughty attitude. If you glance later, you'll see that all the way through from chapter 26 uh, through to the end of chapter 28, it is about the same place. It is about Tyre. We are presented with a Bible documentary on this ancient coastal 
town or city of Tyre. It sits about 100 miles northwest of Jerusalem on the Mediterranean coast. It was part of the ancient nation of Phoenicia, and it was a very, very famous place in the ancient world. It was known, renowned for its vast wealth and its opulence. But what you see as you look through these chapters in God's spiritual analysis of the people of Tyre. Do you know what the repeated theme is? Chapter after chapter after chapter, pride. Pride, that's the city. Pride, pride. You have a highly inflated view of yourself. Now this morning, our focus is gonna be on chapter 28. And there are two vital truths that we discover about high self-esteem. Now they're not hard, they're rather pithy, and they're rather direct. First, pride is stupid. And we're going to discover why. That's verses 1 to 10. And pride is sad. And that's the rest of the chapter. So first of all, pride is stupid. Uh, look at verse 1, chapter 28. Uh, the word of the Lord came to me, that is to Ezekiel the prophet, son of man, say to the ruler of Tyre, this is what the sovereign Lord says. In the pride of your heart, you say, I am a God. I sit on the throne of a God and the heart of the seas. But you are a mere mortal and not a God, though you think you are as wise as a God. Are you wiser than Daniel? Is no secret hidden from you? By your wisdom and understanding, you have gained wealth for yourself. That's what he thinks. And amass gold and silver in your treasuries. By your great skill and trading, you have increased your wealth. And because of your wealth, your heart has grown proud. So in these uh, verses, the camera, God's camera, is pointed straight at one particular person. Not in the previous chapters, that's to the city. But now in chapter 28, the camera is zoomed in on the ruler of Tyre, who at this point in human history is called King F. Baal II. There you can scribble that down and impress your friends. King Ethbel. Well, he's not going to go down in history, is he? Uh, he's not going to be down in history writing blogs about the paralyzing effects of low self-esteem. <laughs> That's not the problem of King Ethbel II. He is at the opposite end of the spectrum. He's smart. He's confident. He's determined. And this king rules over a prosperous city, and he has loads of money in his bank. And how does he credit his success? Well, to himself, to his superior wisdom and skill. He is the living example, if I can put it like this, of the man in the poem Invictus by William Ernest Henley. Do you know how that poem ends? It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. The ruler of Tyre is convinced, utterly convinced, that he is in charge of his day, that he's in charge of his dreams, and he's in charge of his destiny. He's self-assured, and he is full of pompous self-confidence. Or put it slightly differently, in his heart, he has dethroned God, and he's exalted himself. Now, here's the question. How will the true God of the Bible respond to this haughty, treasonous attitude displayed against the true and living God? How will he respond to this tiny human being? Well, look at verse 6. This is God's response. Therefore, notice the connection. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Because you think you are wise, as wise as a God, I'm going to bring foreigners against you, the most ruthless of nations. They will draw their swords against your beauty and wisdom and pierce your shining splendor. They will bring you down. Notice that he has lifted himself up, but he will be brought down to the pit, and he will die a violent death in the heart of the seas. Will you then say, I am a God? In the presence of those who kill you, you will be but a mortal, not a God. So even though the ruler of Tyre thinks of himself as a self-made man, the truth is very different. He may like to boast about his magnificent wisdom. He may love to boast and tell his friends about his monumental talents, but he is not a God. 
He is as mortal as you and me. He's not the master of his fate. He is not the captain of his soul. Indeed, his course is directed from heaven above. And when God wants to change the coordinate, he does so without any opposition from the king below. Or in the words of verse 10, what are we told? I have spoken, declares the sovereign Lord. That's it. I have spoken, says the Lord. That's all that has to happen when the, not just the Lord, that is the covenant God of Israel, but the sovereign Lord, that is the God in utter charge of the universe, when he says something will happen, that is it. When the Lord speaks, that's the end of the conversation. There's no pushback. There's no renegotiation. There's no compromise settlement. The Lord's will will always be done. Do you know that? The Lord's will will always be done. Uh, Listen to what uh, the Bible says about God and pride. This is God's will in regard to pride. James chapter 4, this is on your handout, I think. God opposes the proud. God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Why does God oppose the proud? Why does God, as you read in the Old Testament, why does he hate pride? Because pride ruins lives, and it dishonors God. Pride ruins lives, not just individual lives. It ruins families. It ruins communities. Pride is devastating, and it ultimately dishonors God. That means that God has set his face against it and will eventually remove it from his universe. Now, let's think about how will God remove pride from his universe. Well, the ultimate judgment day for pride is when? The ultimate judgment day for pride is the judgment day that will be done when Jesus Christ returns from heaven. Let's think about that day. Let's use your imagination. If you want to read more about this, read at the end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 20. There will be a day when every single person who has ever lived will be gathered before the great heavenly throne of Jesus Christ. You imagine in that day, everyone who's ever lived standing before the judgment throne of Jesus Christ, and all of our deeds will be exposed, all of them, based on the evidence of this exposure of what we've thought about and what we have done. Don't just think about the Alexa in the corner of your room listening to everything. This is God's Alexa. This is God revealing everything that we have ever done, and the evidence of that revelation will show that we are guilty of prideful treason against the God who made us. Our hearts will confess that we always wanted to do it my way. Now, the sentence for such a crime is a million times more terrifying than what happened to the king of Tyre in his earthly life. If you think that is devastating and scary, Multiply that by a million, and we're not even close to what it is like to stand before the judgment throne of God and to receive the sentence that we deserve. It is to spend eternity in hell, a place without love, endless regrets, and horrific pain. That's what we deserve, every single one of us. And yet, here's the good news. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was sent on the most loving rescue mission of all. Jesus was sent to save us from the punishment that we deserve in an act not of supreme pride, but in an act of supreme humility. He entered into this world to deal with the problem of pride. Isn't that amazing? The Bible says in Philippians that Jesus didn't consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. In fact, we are told that he humbled himself unto death, even death on a cross, which, of course, is where he suffered the punishment we all deserve for dethroning God. And here is the greatest offer in the world. Jesus says that if we come to him today, we will be saved in the judgment to come. Our deeds will still expose our treachery, but because of divine generosity, our sentence has already been paid. Amazing. For those who humble themselves at the feet of Jesus now in our earthly lives, there is an eternity to look forward to when we will spend 
with Jesus and his people. One day, Jesus will remove uh, pride from the universe. He will remove the people who have failed in humility to bow before him today. God opposes the proud. And one day, he will remove it from his universe. He will show favor to the humble. But you know, before that final day, God also wants to remove pride from our daily lives. God's opposition to pride is not just reserved for the final day. He is at work now by his spirit to humble us under his mighty hand. Uh, becoming a Christian is amazing. Uh, we are forgiven our sins. We become part of a wonderful family. We have hope to come. But we don't become perfect overnight. Uh, we battle against the old nature. We battle against sin. And we battle against pride. You know that, don't you, that pride lurks still in our defiant hearts? And that is a devastating characteristic for human flourishing, both for ourselves and for those around us. And because God so loves us, he wants to deal with the pride in our hearts. Now, there are many different ways that God reminds us that we are not the captain of our earthly vessels. But let me just mention one of his common methods. God loves to frustrate our plans on our projects. I don't know if you are a planner. I don't know if you love to have everything lined up. What happens when it all falls apart? What happens when it all gets delayed? Uh, what happens when all those dreams of decades are abandoned because there just happens to be a global pandemic? Uh, for us and our family at the moment, you may know that we are seeking to move house. Um, we've never had an easy story of moving house in our lives. I meet some Christians who have, and may the Lord bless you in those stories. We've never had one. You know the easy story where you know, you put your house in the market in the morning, someone just happens to bump into you in the afternoon, and then they give you an offer. I know, I've talked to some of you about it, and we praise the Lord, and some of you are not trying to look at me now. <laughs> and it's so by the evening. Praise the Lord. We've never had that sort of story at all. We've always had house sales that have fallen through multiple times, delays, and it's really exhausting. Now, that's been our story again this time, but the Lord has used it again in my life to humble me and to teach me how powerless I am. You know, you can turn the lights on and you can uh, message people and you can smile and you can even do a little dance when people come in. But at the end of the day, if the Lord doesn't move, nothing happens. We're powerless. Now, that's good for me. Don't know what it is for you. But it enables me to trust God for what's best for me uh, regardless of how difficult it might seem. Now, friends, it's not wrong to make plans in our lives. If you know me, you know I'm a planner. But we must learn to hold our plans lightly. Or let me quote to you from the book of James again, James chapter 4. This is also in your handout. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city and spend a year there. Carry on business and make money. You can hear the attitude, can't you, of confidence. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Pride is stupid because God is in charge. Second, uh, pride is sad. That's the focus of verses 11 to 19. Uh, we see this theme highlighted particularly in verses 11 and 12. So have a listen to this. Uh, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Now the word to look out for and ponder is the word lament. It's what he's to take up. A lament is a song. A lament is a song in a minor key, often used in funerals. It's an expression of sadness and disappointment. It's fun, isn't it, musicians? You just heard me talk about a minor key. You know I have no understanding of what I'm talking about. But people do tell me that the major key is full of joy and happiness, and the minor key is not. That's as much as I've got, okay? It's an expression of sadness, disappointment. Uh, a lament is a way of expressing emotion of disappointment. Ezekiel was told 
to write a song, a lament for the king of power. That's the mood. Now, the key question at this point is, who is it for, this king of Tyre? And there are two popular opinions. Either it is the same person as before, that is the human king of Tyre, or option two, it is about the spiritual power, the spiritual ruler who is acting behind this human king, that is the enemy of God and his people commonly called Satan or the devil. Those are our two options. And of course, the difference of opinion, if you're trying to work out why, arises because of the vivid descriptions that are used in these verses of this individual. Let me read some verses, then you see what I mean. Verse 12 continues. You, about this ruler, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. And then we get a list. Your settings and mountains were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God, and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to earth. I made a spectacle of you before king. So here we go. There are two views. One view uh, sees these verses as just highly, not just, but highly symbolic description of the king of Tyre, that human leader using the language in the book of Genesis. That is, the idea that he, the king of Tyre, was in the Garden of Eden. And how was he in the Garden of Eden? Not because he's remarkably old, but because he was in the Garden of Eden in Adam. Okay, this is a description, essentially, of those who are in Adam, and Adam as God's appointed great king, that first king, full of wisdom and, and position, who was supposed to rule the garden and the world um, under God's mighty hand. Now, of course, to reach that conclusion, uh, there needs to be a few alternative translations that need to be followed in these verses. But according to that view, if it is that, a description of the human king of Tyre in Adam in the Garden of Eden, what's the point of it? Well, according to that view, the point is to show how humanity has fallen from God's original intention. That's the point. So it takes you back to the way it should have been. And by comparison, you see how the king of Tyre is living. So that's one view. The other view sees these verses describing a different ruler entirely, a different spiritual ruler standing behind the king of Tyre, and that is Satan himself. And of course, if that is true, then what we have here is a summary of the devil's beginnings, or at least some of that originally uh, described here as a guardian angel. Some of you ask sometimes, how did Satan get in the garden? Well, what if his purpose there was to be a guardian, was to be a a, a strength uh, to the first human beings, but through pride, he fell from his high position, and not just himself uh, persuaded humanity to go with him. That's view number two, and view number two incorporates some of the lessons from view number one, because of course, it is not just the fall of Satan, it is the fall of humanity as he wrecks God's original plan. So what is it? I wanted to give you the two uh, options. I'm slightly more persuaded it is the second one, However, either way, um, our response to pride is sadness. Either view, it is sadness. Uh, Whenever we see pride before our eyes, it is a reminder of how this was never meant to be. God's original intention for Satan, uh, for that original guardian angel, God's original intention for the whole of humanity was, yes, to be in a highly exalted position, but humbly submitted before his throne. But neither Satan or our original ancestors were content with that. They all wanted to ascend the mountain of the Lord and claim the throne for themselves. And we follow in their footsteps, not content to submit to the word of our higher authority. They wanted to decide truth for themselves. Not just do they want to know good and evil, they want to decide it for themselves. And the result of their actions is a world fractured by sin, filled with billions of haughty sinners. Now, friends, what that means is that throughout our lives, we will see huge amounts 
of proud people. And what does that mean for us? Well, our response should be twofold. Sadness and hope. First, sadness. We inhabit a broken world. It's not all upbeat, is it? Many of our songs are in the major key. But I think there's a lesson for us that in life, it is okay to find the minor key. Because we live in a world fractured by sin and brokenness. And we will have to navigate that world. Pride is a reminder of a better purpose that was never chosen. So there is sadness. But there's hope. Uh, because it also reminds us when we see the fallenness, it reminds us of a better future that was chosen. And not chosen by us, but chosen by Jesus. Because Jesus Christ did not grasp onto what was his, but he gave it up, taking on human flesh so that he could come down. And what would he do? He, would, he was coming to build a new humanity. A new humanity that was gloriously humble, following in his footsteps, because he came to sacrifice, and now he creates a people that are not puffed up, parading themselves before God, but bowing down in adoration to the great Savior King. Now, this isn't quick, but by God's Spirit, isn't it beautiful to live in a new humanity? And you look around, and people are humble. So what does that all mean for us? Two things. I think it means let's get on board. If you haven't yet joined the new humanity, if you haven't yet joined the Lord Jesus Christ, there is only one way in, and it's not pride, it is humility at the throne of Jesus Christ. Enter, enter into this beautiful people, and he will change you. And let's continue to build. Come to Jesus and with his help. Let's build it. Let's build a new humanity that is a joy to be part of. Let's enjoy being part of it, and let's seek under God to see it grow and grow. Friends, Nothing is more satisfying, and nothing is more important. Let's pray. Why don't you take a moment to respond to the Lord? Maybe you have to acknowledge today afresh that He is the Lord and you are not. Maybe there is repentance of pride. Maybe there is entry to the kingdom of Christ for the first time. Why don't you speak to God and then I'll pray. Father, our world around us bears all the evidence of the devastation of human rebellion. We feel sad at that. We feel sad because of your original intention. And yet, our hearts, because of Jesus, are filled with hope. We thank you for this new humanity, this new people, this church that we are part of. And we look forward to the day when Jesus will come back and when this world will be gloriously restored. Father, help us to believe that there is nothing more satisfying and nothing more important than following Jesus all our life. Amen.